Hello there and a really warm welcome to Sit in a Hill and Church Online. My name is Paul and it's my privilege to be one of the pastors and part of the team at City on a Hill. Let's just pray before we go any further um, today. Lord God, eternal God, God seated on your throne and in control, we worship you. We pray now that as we engage with your word and with worship and with one another, that your spirit will come and speak to each one of us wherever we're at and however we're connecting today. We pray this in the mighty name and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So just a welcome again. It is really good to be together, whatever part of the world, wherever you are, you're joining us today and it's great to be together. I just want to encourage you that community, even if it's through the waves, so to speak, the airwaves, it's really, really important. Um, just connection. It's not good for us to be alone. It's really important that we're part of a community. So. Thank you for being part of the Church Online community. Um, we have a live team with us today as you are connecting, and they are there and available if you have prayer requests or you have questions that you wish to raise. Feel free also to um, request prayer by clicking the prayer button. And if you're watching from TV screen or on YouTube, you can request prayer there as well and just visit us at cityonahill.org.uk forward slash prayer. Be part of the community, interact, talk to us, be together today. We're now going to hand over for a time of worship and um, so let me just encourage you, put away the distractions and don't get distracted by whatever it is, just calm your heart. The psalm says, be still and know that he is God. So wherever you're at, just be still and know that he's God and engage with us in this worship time. I'll hand over to the worship guys now. Thank you.
words. We trust in you, O oh God. You alone are worthy, O oh God. Thank you, um, guys on the worship team, for leading us um, today. We're going to open God's Word, and I love doing that, and I'm sure you do as well. We are part of a, going through a series called um, This Is Our Church, Who We Are As A Church, and our core foundational truth is this. We love God, we love people, and we make disciples. And now we're beginning to unpack some aspects of that. We've talked about humility, and today is a fantastic topic um, word and spirit. What does it mean <clears throat> to be fully committed to the Word of God? And what does it mean to be fully committed and believing in the Holy Spirit? And that's what Pete is going to unpack in a minute or two. As we are listening to the Word of God, you can still interact with us, comment, make comments on what Pete's saying, ask questions about it, and be part of the community. And just Jumping ahead to the end of today's moment, um, we have virtual coffee. I'll explain that to you later on, but that's just a great opportunity to connect with people. So without anything more to say, I'm going to hand over to Pete and we're going to open up this fantastic topic, Word and Spirit. Thanks, Pete. Well, welcome to Church Online. My name is Pete, pastor here at City on the Hill, and it's my joy to welcome each and every one of you to our online experience. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. And, uh, and hey, I don't know where everyone's at with their journey with God, but my hope and prayer is, as we have these times together, that if you don't know God, that you'd come to know him, which is the greatest adventure ever. You can know God. Let me pray as we turn to some really important truths. Uh, let me pray and ask that God will help us as we listen. Father, our eyes are on you just now. We look to you. I pray, God, you'd both help me to speak and articulate what you've placed in my heart. And I pray for everyone who's listening, God, I pray that we would hear truth, that God, truth would go deep in our souls. God, we, <clears throat> we even are bold enough to ask, would you change our lives? So come, Holy Spirit, help me to speak, help us to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been going through a series which we've called This Is Our Church. And in this series, we're taking time to dive deeply into City on a Hill's purpose and values. So just as a recap, here are our purpose and values. And each week we're going through each one of these. So let me give you the overview and then we're going to zoom in on one of them in particular. Okay, so here's our purpose. Number one, we, our purpose is we're here to love God, love people and make disciples. And that sums up Jesus' great commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbour as yourself. And then also the Great Commission, go and make disciples. So that's what we're committed to. We're, it's the very thing that Jesus asked us to do. Uh, our, our values are, okay, here, here's our first value. Our core value, first of all, is we value humility. And we looked at that last week. That's so core to who we are. Secondly, this is what we're going to look at this week. We are a word and spirit church. We're word and spirit church. And then the third core value is we think big about his church and its mission. And then... Finally, we've got two aspirational values. This is what we're becoming. And uh, our aspirational values are we value community. We want to become more and more welcoming, diverse community. And then number two, our second aspirational value is we value healthy leadership. That's who we are and that's what we're becoming. And uh, this, is our, this is who we are. This is our church. But let me dive it into specifically we are a word and spirit church. Okay, let me, let me start with a story. Uh, there was a couple, a Christian couple, and they said, we want a dog, but we don't just want any dog. We want a Christian dog. So they were walking along the street one day, they passed a pet shop, and in the window it says, Christian puppies for sale. And they thought, wow, look at that. What are the chances? So they went in, and they said to the pet shop owner, I'm interested in one of your Christian puppies. And they said, yeah, here you go. And they brought this beautiful little puppy out. And they said, so how is the puppy a Christian? Oh, the owner said, watch this. And he says, um, go and get the Bible. And uh, the dog ran along, jumped up on the, on the desk, picked up a Bible in its mouth and brought the Bible back and placed it on the floor at their feet. <laughs> the owners were like, wow, this is amazing. So the guy said, oh, well, watch this. Turn to Psalm 23 and the dog with his paw turned the pages to Psalm 23 and put his paw on the, on, on the very first verse. They were absolutely amazed. They said, sold, we, we buy it, we buy it. 
So they bought this Christian puppy, brought it home, and that night they thought, we're gonna bring some friends over to see our little puppy. And they're all sitting around and they said, watch this. And they got, go get the Bible. And the dog brought the Bible back yeah, and then opened Psalm 23 and they did it. And the people were like, this, I've never seen anything like this before. He said, does it know regular commands? And the owner said, oh, we don't know. Well, let's try. So uh, sit and the dog sat, lie down, dog lay down, roll over, roll over. Amazing, look at that. He said, heel. And the dog ran up and jumped on the sofa and placed his hands on the owner's head and bowed its head to pray. <laughs> and then everyone said, oh, it's a Pentecostal Christian. Okay, there we go. Um, we are, what are we? Well, as a church, we are, we're not just word, we're also spirit. And we're not just spirit, we're also word. And for us, these two words are really important. Let me read you the full value. We are a words and spirit church. We teach and build on scripture and earnestly desire the Holy Spirit's gifts, guidance and empowering presence. We trust the power of the gospel to transform lives. So that's, that's our full value. We believe that. That's who we are. Word and spirit is our way of saying we're building as a church on deep truth convictions. We totally passionately believe in God's word, the Bible. And we totally passionately believe and depend upon God's Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth. So let's kind of unpack those two and see how those two overlap. So first of all, we're a word-based church. We believe in the Bible. We believe it's God's word and we believe it's our final authority. And when you think about the Bible, I mean, it is the most despised book. It is the most denied book, the most disputed book, the most dis dissected, the most debated book. It is the most outlawed book, the most destroyed book, and the most banned book in all history. And yet, despite this, the Bible is still the most read book in the world, the most published book in the world, the most translated book in the world, the best-selling book of all time. There is no book like it. And the Bible has, insp has inspired more art, music, art, and architecture than any other book that ever has been. It's become the very bedrock of entire civilizations. Our legal system in the UK is based on Jesus's teaching found in the Bible. We see the healthcare system in India based on people who built their lives on the Bible. And all over the world, it brings liberty and freedom. It is an incredible book. It's God's book, it's, the, it's very word. Here's some facts about the Bible. It was written over a period of 1500 years by over 40 authors from different walks of life. You have kings, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, poets, and scholars. It's written in different places. You've got it in, written in wildernesses and dungeons and palaces. Written in three different continents, written in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It has a variety of uh, genres of literature. We have poetry, letters, songs, history, statistics, the book of numbers. It contains over 3,000 verses of already fulfilled prophecy. There is no book on earth that can make such a claim. And actually every year between 200 and 500 million Bibles are published and it's now available in well over 3,000 languages. It's an incredible book. This is what the Bible says about the Bible. Paul writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, he says, all scripture is inspired by God. New International Version puts it this way, all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is God breathed. A way I guess you could understand that is, let's take a, you know, you get these jazz musicians who not only can play one instrument, but they actually have this ability to jump between instruments. So let's take the famous Miles Davis from a previous generation, this jazz, jazz musician, you know, you could see Miles Davis uh, and he jumps onto uh, the clarinet and he's playing away his jazz music. And then he can then just equally jump onto the saxophone, playing away in the saxophone. And then he can jump on the trumpet and he jazz away in the trumpet. He's got this ability to jump between instruments, but you'll find it's all My Miles Davis's breath, but it's a different sounds coming out each instrument, different personality, you could say, coming out each instrument. And so it is with the Bible. All scripture is God breathed. God is the one breathing. God is the one speaking. It's all his inspired truth. But it's coming through the different personalities 
of the authors. And I love that. It's not like the authors of the Bible sat down to write and all of a sudden their hand starts automatically moving like as, it, as if it were a Ouija board. No, God doesn't operate that way. That's a, it's demonic. God instead empowers people. God works with our free will. And so in the Bible, you see the personalities of the writers coming through in their pages. So you see the personality of Peter coming through in his letters and you see the personality of David coming through in the Psalms. And it's, it's just wonderful that God takes these ordinary human beings and divinely inspires them with his great thoughts and his great truths and the word of God comes forth through ordinary people. I love that. This is the Bible. We believe it's written by God, sorry, authored by God, but written by men. And I think that's so, so important. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, talking about scripture, he says, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy has ever come about by the act of a human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit <coughs> spoke from God. So here we have this understanding that it was inspired by God. And because it's inspired by God, they're led by the Holy Spirit. Because it's inspired by God, we believe, therefore, it is infallible. That means it's incapable of error because God doesn't lie. So it's inspired. Therefore, it's infallible. It's incapable of error. Therefore, we believe it is indeed inerrant. It is without error. So we believe that. And even in the apparent contradictions, oh, how is it that this resurrection account looks different from that resurrection account? Well, there is very simple and clear, understandable ways to even describe what at first appears like a contradiction. But actually, if you dig a little bit deeper, there is no contradiction. The scripture is an amazing book pulled together over this huge period of time by a wide range of authors who didn't collaborate. And yet the message of God rings through like a golden thread all the way through all of the 66 books of the Bible. Incredible. What a book. And for us... It is the plumb line. For us, it's, it is what we weigh everything against. <clears throat> you see, a city on a hill, what do we mean we're a word and spirit church? Well, we're a word church because we don't teach primarily our opinion. We don't, you know, it's good to have opinions, but that's not our authority. Having opinions is important, but God's opinion is more important than our opinion. We don't teach our opinion. We don't teach tradition. Our allegiance isn't to people's opinions or people's traditions in church history. Nothing wrong with tradition if it doesn't contradict the Bible. We're not here to remain true to popular culture. Uh, today's contemporary culture, I mean, that's all over the place. The scripture remains constant. So our allegiance, even if it's popular or not popular, is to the Bible. And that's, that's what we believe at City on a Hill. We want to approach it, it links to our value last week. We we believe in humility. We want to approach it with a humility rather than us seeing as we're over the book. No, no, the book's over us. The book is God's word and he's Lord. And that's important. So we can't avoid this, the tough verses. This, this book's full of amazing truths and also, oh, earth-shaking truths. And we can't avoid the tough bits. We've got to, we believe the tough bits as well as the easy bits. So we believe that sin is sin. And no matter what our culture says, sin is sin. We believe that judgment is real. We believe that there is a real place called hell and heaven. We believe in the tough bits as well as the easy bits. We believe what the Bible says about marriage. We believe what the Bible says about sex. We believe what the Bible says about money. We believe what the Bible says about the world and its future. So we hold to this book and it's a, it's a tough book, but it's an awesome book and we approach it with humility. You know, if you ask, well, what does City on a Hill believe about Da, da, da. The answer is, what does the Bible say about da, da, da? That's it. I mean, that's, that's kind of where we land. We land with, what, does, what do we believe about this? Well, what does the Bible say about this? And as I said earlier, it's, it's like a plumb line. So builders, when they're building a wall, they hold up a plumb line. And the plumb line always hangs perfectly vertical. And they hold the plumb line against the wall that they've built to see if what they've built, it lines up with what is true. And so also we hold the plumb line against our church. And we hold our plumb, the plumb line, the God's word, against our lives. And uh, we're not the authority, it's the authority. And so we align ourselves rather than saying, oh no, no, my life's going off at this angle, so I'm true. No, if we're off at the wrong angle or our church is off track, we bring it online with what God says. That's our authority. So that's what we believe at City in a Hill. So because of this, we're against lies. 
we're against untruths because we believe in the truth. So you, you could, if you had two different arrows going two different directions, you've got truth going this way and you've got lies going the opposite way. And so we're against untruths. And, you know, our society is full of that. Uh, our society says good is bad and bad is good. And if you believe certain truths, you're actually a hate person or if you, you know, it, it turns and twists truth around. But we're not just against obvious lies. We're all, also against subtle deception. We're passionately against that. So you imagine you've got an arrow going this way, which is truth. And you've got an arrow going not the opposite way, but a few degrees off truth. We're also against that. And you could call that liberalism. We're passionately against liberalism, where liberals start to water down what the Bible says or take bits out or add bits in or twist what it says. And actually, liberalism finds its root in Genesis chapter 3 with a snake speaking in the garden. And this is what Satan said to Eve way back those centuries ago, those millennia ago. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Did God really say you must not eat from any of the fruit? from any tree in the garden. See, what Satan does here is he questions, did God really say? He questions the Bible. He questions God's word. And he misquotes God's word because actually it isn't, he isn't quoting exactly. God didn't say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. He said there's one you can eat, sorry, you can eat from any tree, but you cannot eat from this one. So Satan questions and he misquotes. And so liberals do this all the time. They question scripture. We're not here to question scripture. If you, hey, if you're not going to be a Christian, fine, don't believe the Bible. But if you're going to be a Christian, don't pick and choose what you like in the Bible. It's our book, right? You just embrace it or you don't become a Christian. So, but don't pick and choose. Don't question scripture and don't misquote scripture to your own ends. And then Genesis 3 verse 4, Satan says, you will not certainly die. Here, he directly contradicts God's word. God said, you will die in the day you eat of it. Now, Satan was doing a half-truth because they didn't drop dead when they ate the fruit. But spiritually, they absolutely did die instantaneously the moment they moved out from under God's authority. <clears throat> and then we see he questions God's motive. He says, for God knows that when you eat from it, this is verse 5, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. See, he's saying, see, God's not wanting you to have the fruit because he doesn't have the best intentions in mind. He, he knows if you do that, it's going to elevate you and he doesn't want that for you. Satan here is questioning God's motive and so in effect what they've got is they've got a Bible and they're working through the Bible the liberals do this and they and they say oh we don't like this they've got a pair of scissors and they chop out the bits they don't like or they rip out pages they don't like and they throw it away and what you end up with is something that does not resemble God's word so that's we're passionately against that we're against liberalism because we believe in truth I was had a coffee uh, a couple of weeks ago with Gavin Calver. Gavin is the head of Evangelical Alliance in the UK. Great guy. And we had a nice coffee, we had a catch up. And in the, in the course of our chat, <clears throat> he was saying, do you know, believing in the Bible these days is getting harder and harder. And he's saying, and do you know, you've, we're facing more and more opposition for truths we hold to. And he said, him and his wife were having a chat. And this is what he said to me. He said, him and his wife were having a chat recently. And they came to the conclusion that, do you know what? If it came to it, he said, I'd be willing to go to prison for holding to the Bible. And I thought, wow. And I thought, because City and Hill were part of Evangelical Alliance. And I thought to myself, with a guy like that leading it, who's willing for the sake of truth to even go to prison, I said, you've got my vote, Gavin. <laughs> so if, you, if, if you're a church leader and you're not part of the Evangelical Alliance, Gavin Calvin's a good guy, join the Evangelical Alliance. Wow, that's a guy I can follow who's willing to even go to prison. And hey, <clears throat> let me throw this out there. You might be joining today and you're not there yet with God. You're not a Christian, you're not a follower of Jesus. And you might be thinking, wow, this is different. <laughs> you're listening to what I'm saying. You're thinking, this is so different to culture. Culture says, oh, believe what you want. If it feels good, do it. That's what culture says. And then maybe that's the mantra you've been living by. And here's me saying, no, we believe in the Bible. In fact, we humble ourselves under God's word and we submit to God's truth. And that is in sharp contrast to what you've experienced. But let me just put it to you that what you experience isn't bringing life, it's bringing death. And God's word will bring life. And so I'm not asking you to submit to my word, I'm asking you to submit to God's word. I'm not asking you even to join my church, although you'd be welcome to. I'm asking you to connect with Jesus and then find a good church. And City on the Hill, I think, is one of those. So follow Jesus. And uh, actually, what we're finding all over the world today is actually people in a world that's so messed up and so shades of grey 
people are looking for kind of black and white. At the end of my life, when I'm lying on my deathbed, I don't want to have believed shades of gray. You know, believe what you like, blah, blah, blah. I want to have stood on truth and believed in truth. And when I breathe my last breath, I'm dying with a confidence, not in me, but in God who saved me. Jesus is alive. He died for you on the cross and rose again. He is the true savior. Put your faith in him today. So we're a word church. Okay, look, part of that, let me talk about a movement which re-emphasized this in recent history. And it's called the Reformation. Back in the 1500s, the Reformation took place. The world was changing in the 1500s. Certain things had happened. A monk called Martin Luther from Germany had pinned his colors to the mast or to the door in Wittenberg. And he said, this is what I'm believing in. And he's building by conscience and he's holding to the Bible. And a Reformation started. At the same time as that, the printing press, the Gu uh, Gutenberg, Johannes Gutenberg had invented the printing press, the Gutenberg press. And all of a sudden, it was like ideas that Martin Luther was preaching and believing, scriptural truth, was suddenly starting to spread rapidly across, uh, across Europe. And here, over here in the UK, let me tell you one story about one guy. In fact, this is Scotland's first Protestant martyr. Young guy, early 20s. Patrick Hamilton, he's called. He, he grew up in uh, Scotland, born 1504. Age 14, he went to university in Paris. <laughs> These days, 14-year-olds like, hey, I got gold medal on FIFA <laughs> on Xbox, right? In those days, they went to university in Paris. He went to university, very intelligent kid. And it, it was there he heard the gospel and became convinced of the truth about Jesus' death and resurrection. Because the world at the time was, it, it's coming out of the dark ages, it's full of silly religion. Uh, I, I, have, I love the Roman Catholic people and believers, absolutely, but in the dark ages, Roman Catholicism was a dark thing. It, it, it taught people not the true gospel, but often the false gospel. And people weren't knowing that you could be saved by simply trusting in Jesus' work for you. They thought they, they had to earn their salvation themselves. So Patrick Hamilton heard the gospel for the first time when he was in Paris. And then when he came back to the UK, he came back as a 20 year old and became a professor at St. Andrews University. And again, that doesn't usually happen these days, usually in your 30s or 40s. 20 year old professor at St. Andrews University. And as he was reading the scripture, and he read the scripture. And one of the things that also happened was a man called Tyndale, as part of the Reformation. He had literally, he, he had, illegally translated the Bible into common language so regular people could read the Bible. It was like incredible because up till that point it was only the priests who kept the Bible to themselves and kind of um, diffused their knowledge to the people. So people weren't exposed to the truth themselves but all of a sudden the Bible's available in everyday language and this guy Patrick Hamilton reads scripture, finds Jesus, is totally set on fire for God and starts as a 20 year old preaching the gospel. <clears throat> it was when he was 24 that the Cardinal Beaton, the Archbishop, the Catholic Archbishop of St. Andrews, invited him to a debate. And he went to this debate, but it was actually a trap. He was arrested and they rushed through a heresy trial. A heresy trial would usually take weeks and weeks. This was a 12 hour heresy trial. And the next day, Patrick Hamilton was burned at the stake. It, it took six hours for him to die as he was burned at the stake in St. Andrews. And if you go to St. Andrews today, there in the street, uh, one of the main streets there, you'll see a PH on the ground, which represents Patrick Hamilton. And he was the first Scottish Protestant martyr. People who believed a man who died for holding to the Bible. So we believe in the word of God. And City on the Hill, I want us to be a Bible literate church. And you know, we've, we have this wonderful opportunity with the thing that I, I've managed to get off the ground called the Global Classroom. My friend George Alexander is running regular theology courses in the global classroom. This coming term, we've got Introduction to the New Testament. And I would encourage you, why not enroll for some of these courses? Go deeper, d dive deep into what you believe. Become convinced, really fall in love with this amazing book, the Bible. We're a word church. Let me talk about, the, I guess, the kind of divide. So I'm going to move on from the word now. And in a, in a moment, I'm going to talk about how we're a spirit church. But before I do that, let me talk about the fact that there is actually a bit of a divide between the word and the spirit certainly in the Christian world. You have the word people who are evangelicals and you have the spirit people who are the charismatics. And there is in reality in, in the Christian world a bit of a divide. For us, there's no divide. But in the Christian world, there is a divide between evangelicals and charismatics, or certainly there has been, and it's becoming less and less. 
I became a Christian in the, in the 1990s, 1991. And I remember growing up in the 1990s as a new Christian. I, I went to a church that wasn't charismatic, that didn't believe or experience or see miracles or see the power, that people didn't speak in tongues, that sort of thing wasn't unheard of. Um, but I was around a lot of people who were very reformed and evangelical. They believed in the Bible, they taught the Bible. And, but some of them didn't believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were even around today. So you had, over here you had the reformed people. And then I started to visit churches that were charismatic and Pentecostal. In fact, I had personally experienced speaking in tongues. And I started being, seeing churches or attending churches or visiting churches that were having these experiences. And this is what I was finding. It was like, it was like these two circles, reformed and reformed evangelical and you had Pentecostal charismatic over here but it's like the two circles weren't overlapping they were separated they were separated out and what what you would find is if when you're among the reformed people they would refer to the charismatics and the Pentecostals they would say oh they're they're bible light or they're the happy clappy people <laughs> like they're a little bit simple or you know what are their qualifications many of them don't even have a theological qualification when they're leading a church or they would say things like, oh, it's all about subjective feelings. There's no objective truth. Or, they would, or some, some people said, in fact, I remember meeting one guy in Argyle Street, Glasgow, who was a reformed Bible teacher and he was preaching on the street. And I went over to encourage him. And when he found out that I spoke in tongues, he said, do you not realize that's from the devil? <laughs> you think, wow. So these are these reformed people criticizing the charismatic. Uh, and, and to be honest, to be honest, the charismatic Pentecostal movement has given plenty of fuel to that criticism because actually how many there's been so many sc scandals and people going to extreme for example the prosperity gospel or extreme views within the Pentecostal charismatic movement and so they've given them plenty of ammunition to take pot shots against them so you've got this criticism from the reformed evangelicals of the charismatic Pentecostals but then also you have the Pentecostal charismatics who make criticism of the reformed evangelicals. They would say things like, oh, they're dead, or oh, they're religious, or, or they're lukewarm, or they're a bit legalistic, or they're a bit dry and boring. That was the kind of comments you'd hear among those circles, certainly in the 1990s. But I believe with all my heart, these two circles are not to be separate, but these two circles are to totally overlap. And what is a joy in, in our generation, actually more and more, is you're seeing the word and the spirit in churches flowing together more and more. In fact, we see that in the Bible itself. Genesis chapter one, it says, verses two and three, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light. So there we see God's spirit. And then God spoke the word and the spirit from the very beginning. And then we see when Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit and truth, he said in John 16, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own, he will only speak what he hears and he will tell you what is to come. So here Jesus is saying the word and the spirit and the spirit is to lead people into the word. You see, the Holy Spirit will never give you a doctrinally wacky thought. <laughs> the Holy Spirit always works with the word because the same God who authored the word is now moving in power among you by his spirit. So this is the word and the spirit. And so it is to work together. David Pawson put it this way, the word is interpreted by the spirit, but the spirit is identified by the word. So we're not to read the Bible without the power of the spirit or teach the Bible without the power of the spirit. But at the same time, we are to test whether it is truly the Holy Spirit by the Bible. How do you know a prophecy is actually accurate? Well, you test it by the Bible. You see, the charismatic, my Pentecostal and charismatic convictions came from me reading the Bible. I mean, I remember as a 15-year-old, I'd just become a Christian, and literally, I'd, I started reading the Bible. And with, like a childlike faith, reading the Bible, I came across the fact that people were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. And without adding any complexity to it, I just said, okay, well, that's Christianity then. And I got a friend to pray for me, and I became filled with the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues. It was, it was my belief in the miraculous, my belief in healings and miracles. It came from reading the Bible. So the idea that you can be a Bible-believing person and not charismatic, to me is like, I don't know what Bible you're reading because my Pentecostal charismatic convictions came out of my Bible reading. 
I came out of deep conviction. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit because the Bible talks about it. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit because in the book of Acts, you see it all over the place. And equally, my reformed evangelical convictions comes from the power of the Spirit. Because when I'm reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit shows me something, I'm reading the Bible and it's like the verses jump off the page. It's like, I think, glory to God. It's like, wow. It's like I'm reading the book with the author of the book showing me things. And it's the most exciting. So my biblical evangelical convictions come from the Holy Spirit's leading. So there is no contradiction. So we are a word church, but also we are a spirit-empowered church. Let me read our value again. We are a word and spirit church. We teach and build on scripture, earnestly desiring the Holy Spirit's gifts, guidance, and empowering presence. We trust in the power of the gospel to change lives. So we are a spirit-empowered church. You know, the belief that the gifts of the Holy Spirit passed away is the belief that's called cessationism. And I have to say, and I'm very pleased about this, cessationism, cessationists are a dying breed. They that when I was in the 1990s, there was quite a few of them around in Scotland. But really, you don't hear that view much anymore. What you do hear a lot of people saying is, we've become evangelical charismatics. And they believe in the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit. But here's the challenge. Many people who believe in the charismatic today, they believe in it, but it's not like they've seen a leg grow recently when they were prayed for, or heard a prophecy recently in church. So we don't want to just be theoretical charismatics. We want to be experiential charismatics. So we are committed to experiencing, not merely believing in the power of the Holy Spirit. At City and Hill, we want to see miracles. We want to see lives changed. We want to see exorcisms. We want to see God do the miracles that we see in the Bible. But you might say, but, but Pete, surely that's up to God. Well, not so. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 tells us that we are to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. In other words, if it was just up to God, that verse wouldn't be there. But no, the ball, God is putting the ball in our court and he's saying, come on, earnestly desire these spiritual gifts. God's already made his decision. He's willing and he's ready and he's passionate. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul says, when you come together, each of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. And so our passion is that each of you, not just the leaders at the front, but it should be a church flowing in this. So when you go to small group, when you're with other believers, or when you come to a church service, I want you to stir yourself, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, and bring a prophecy, whether it be from the front or whether it be with a one-to-one -one moment with someone, bring prophecies, seek God for revelations, bring tongues and bring interpretation. Let's step out with courage in these great areas. We believe that Acts is a vision of what church life can be rather than a record of what it once was. That's really important. When I'm reading through the pages of the book of Acts and it describes the early church, I'm not just hearing, it's like God holding a carrot out and say, look what they had, but you don't have that anymore. I don't believe that's what God's doing. I think God's giving us a blueprint and saying, I think this is what we are to experience in every generation. So what do you see in Acts? You see people being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and prophesying. What you see in Acts is healings and miracles, the lame healed, the blind seeing, even resurrections happening. What you see in Acts is exorcisms, people who are possessed by demons, being set free in the name of Jesus and with the authority of God's power. Here we see also, we see divine judgments in Acts, where kings were struck dead because of their pride or where sorcerers were struck blind because they were trying to deceive people. You see in the book of Acts supernatural happenings like speaking in tongues, prison doors flying open, visions of heaven, angelic experiences, evangelists disappearing and reappearing in places. Like, wow, just incredible supernatural happenings. You also see in Acts courage in the face of persecution. You see the rapid growth of the church and many, many salvations. And you're seeing the poor being helped with such radical generosity. This is the book of Acts. So I'm convinced this is the church we should see in our day. Say amen if you agree. I believe that and that's what I'm gunning for and that's what I'm longing for. And actually, that's what the population around us here is longing for. They're looking for not just truth, they're looking for truth and power together. That's what's gonna draw them to God. 
a few years ago I was down in Wales and I was speaking at a church in Qumran called Victory Church and uh, I can't remember how many years ago it was now but they had they experienced what they called an, an outpouring and it was triggered by a guy called Paul who was miraculously healed and I've got here's the photo of me and Paul and me and Paul were uh, Paul had been 10 years in a wheelchair having had a uh, an accident that caused him to have Ir irreversible spinal damage 10 years in a wheelchair and in a prayer meeting the power of the Holy Spirit came upon him and he he got out of the wheelchair and he not only got out of the wheelchair he was able to lift the wheelchair right above his head now even fit healthy guys in the church tried that and they couldn't do it but it's like wow he just totally healed and he lifted the wheelchair above his head and, and the place erupted in joy over the next number of weeks 100,000 people visited that church in Wales it's just a few years ago and so many thousands came to faith in Jesus. I love that. It kind of sounds like the book of Acts. And I want to see those things in our generation. Love it. We believe that greater things are possible for God's people. Jesus said this. I mean, listen to this. This is, this is one of those verses that Jesus says. In fact, he starts off by saying, very truly or truly, truly, I tell you. And whenever Jesus says that, you think, okay, he's going to tell us something. We're not going to, it's going to be so out there. We're not going to believe him. So he, he preempts us thinking that by saying, no, very truly, I tell you. So John 14, he says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so the Father may be glorified in the Son. And you read that verse and I, and I mean, you're with me, right? You just think, seriously, Jesus? Greater things than you? And you read the life of Jesus and you see the miracles. Do you see the walking on water? You see the incredible results. And here's Jesus saying, no, no, you can do greater things than these. And he thinks, surely, Jesus, are you, are you serious? How, how is it possible for us to do greater things than Jesus? Well, Jesus gives us the answer in the verse. He says, because I'm going to the Father. And whenever you hear that phrase, Jesus ascended to the Father, what happened when he ascended? Answer. The pouring happened. The Holy Spirit was poured out. When the, Jesus went to the Father, it triggered Pentecost. The ascension triggered the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So the reason we can do greater things than Jesus is because the Holy Spirit has been given. And who is the Holy Spirit? Well, let me read to you how the book of Acts begins. This is what Jesus, this is what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In my former book, I wrote to you all that, about Jesus, sorry, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So here's Luke writing the book of Acts. And in the former book, he wrote about all that Jesus began to do. So Luke's gospel it describes the miracles, describes the life's being changed. That was just what Jesus began to do. Now we're in the book of Acts. The inference is here's what Jesus now continues to do. And the point is this. When Jesus says greater things shall you do, just to be clear, it's not you who does it or me. It's Jesus. Jesus did great miracles in those three years when he ministered on earth. But I have to tell you, in these last 2,000 years, Jesus has done even greater things. It's just that now he does them through us. It's still Jesus. It's not like, all right, we're doing bigger stuff than Jesus was doing. No, it's still Jesus. It's just that he now does it through us. What a privilege. All glory to God. I believe in that. And you know, I also believe in the baptism with the Holy Spirit. This is typically a separate experience from your conversion. There are five examples of this in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 19. And in every one of those occasions, it was a separate experience to their conversion. And it was always manifested with both audible and visible signs. They either spoke in tongues or prophesied or glorified God. And it was visible. There was always a manifestation of some sort. So I believe if you're a believer, maybe you haven't experienced this yet, I believe that you can experience the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I don't want us just to be theoretical believers in the power of God, theoretical charismatics. I want us to be experiential charismatics. So we are truly word and truly spirit as a church. 1906 is when the modern day Pentecostal movement was rebirthed by God with a wonderful precious humble man of God called William Seymour and the 1906 Azusa Street revival saw it was hallmarked by signs and wonders and people speaking in tongues and miracles let me read you an excerpt from a little girl 
who attended one of the meetings in Azusa Street. This is, this is just beautiful. This is a child's experience of Azusa Street. Inside, the place looked like a big plain barn. Most of the seats were rough planks on wooden nail kegs. <clears throat> Most of the seats were taken. As we moved towards an open spot on a rear bench, I suddenly felt a chill. How could that be? It wasn't cold at all. Then my, my, the hair in my arms and legs and head began to stand on end. I felt as if I was surrounded by God. I was trembling. So was my mother and everybody else. On the platform, a black man. Mother said, that's Pastor William J. Seymour. He sat between two wooden boxes on top of one another, and they were his pulpit. He was a plain man with a short beard and a glass eye. Something unusual has happening. In most churches, kids were running around up and down the aisles, twisting and turning in their seats. But here, children seated between their parents, even babies in their mother's arms, were quiet. But that's not, it was not their parents keeping them still. Uh, not, nobody even whispered. All the adults were praying with eyes closed. I knew the Spirit of God was there. Suddenly, people rose to their feet. Everywhere, a hand shot towards heaven. Mine went up also. I hadn't even tried to raise them. So did the hands of the smaller children, even the babies in the arms of black mothers. Big, strong men began to cry aloud, and then women. I felt like crying too. I didn't know why, I just felt, thank you God for letting me be here with you. As I looked around over the congregation, another chill ran down my spine. It was as if, ocean, as if the ocean waves were moving from one end of the congregation to the other. The most thrilling sight I'd ever seen, wave after wave of the spirit went through the hall like a gentle breeze over a cornfield. And again, the crowd settled back down into the seats and prayers began to buzz through the hall. Then tongues of fire suddenly appeared over the heads of some people and a black man with a shining face leaped to his feet. Out of his mouth poured words in some language I'd never heard before. I began to tremble harder than before. When he finished, another black man rose and told us in English what the other man had said. It was a prayer to Jesus. Just then, a quiet settled over the hall and a white woman ju jumped off the bench like a jack-in-a-box. Oh, my blessed Jesus, she cried out with excitement. I can see, I can see. And she placed her hands over her eyes. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the miracle. She plunged into the aisle and began to dance. Her palms reached towards heaven. Thank you, Father, I can see, I can see. Before the night was over, another blind person could see. The deaf could hear and the cripple could walk. It was so exciting. This was my first night of many over the three years in 321 Azusa Street. Wow. Love that. I love that because that's the book of Acts. And I believe that's what God wants us to experience. Charles Spurgeon, the famous Bible teacher from the Metropolitan Tabernacle, he said this, Far too many Christians have come only through Calvary, and not, but not through Pentecost. So as a result, we are butterflies when we are meant to be eagles. God wants us to come through both Calvary and Pentecost. He wants us to come to the cross and then be empowered by his spirit. So again, let me throw this out. You might be listening into this and you're not following Jesus yet. And my appeal to you is we're a word church. We believe in truth. We believe in this book called the Bible, but we also, we don't, we don't believe in an old dead religion, some historical experience. We believe in a current real relationship with a powerful God today. And we call you into that relationship. And for those of you who are believers, if you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit, this is an experience for you. So in conclusion, we are a word and spirit church. We teach and build in scripture, earnestly desiring the Holy Spirit's gifts, guidance and empowering presence. We trust in the power of the gospel to transform lives. I guess the best way of summing up what I'm kind of gunning for here as a church is in Acts chapter 20, where the Apostle Paul, the great Bible teacher, this is what it says in Acts 20. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept talking till midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story, and he was picked up dead. Paul went down and threw himself on the young man, man and threw his arms around him. Do not be alarmed, he said, he is alive. Then he went upstairs and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and greatly comforted. <laughs> what an experience. Imagine you're there. 
So here you've got word and spirit. Here's the Apostle Paul. He was pretty good with the Bible, right? I mean, he wrote the book of Romans. He's a pretty good theologian. And you're on the edge of your seat listening to the Apostle Paul teaching the Bible, not just for a, for a little bit, right through midnight into daybreak. Okay, long, I promise I won't go that long today. Long teaching of the Bible. But you're sitting on the edge of your seat listening to the great Apostle Paul, none other than Paul, teaching the Bible. What a theologian, what an evangelical, what a word-based man. But as you're listening to Paul, if someone falls out the window and dies, the same Paul, who was a great theologian, would also go in the name of Jesus, raise the person from the dead. That's what I'm talking about. I want us to be a church and churches that are so dynamic with the power of the Bible that people are on the edge of their seats as truth is being taught. But at the same time, if someone falls out the window and dies, they're raised from the dead. That's what we're gunning for. David Watson said this, all word and no spirit, we dry up. All spirit and no word, we blow up. Both word and spirit, we grow up. So I want you to commit to being a word and spirit people. Be people of the Bible. Love your Bible, read your Bible, study your Bible. Dive deep into the Bible. Consider, for example, the global classroom as an opportunity to go deep dive into some theology. Become lovers of the truth, communicators of the truth. Don't settle for compromise. Come in line with the truth. And I also want us to be people of the Spirit. If you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit, be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Receive prayer for that. Let's be people who not only experience the filling of the Holy Spirit, but let's be people who bring words to people and pray for the sick and step out and expect those and earnestly desire those spiritual gifts. So we are a word and spirit church. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence with us. Thank you, God, that you who created the worlds by the Holy Spirit hovering over the surface of the deep and then you spoke, let there be light and, and then the word created. Thank you, that same word and spirit, your word and your spirit is active in our lives today. Thank you for giving us a book. Thank you for giving us the Bible. God, I pray that we will be people of the book, people of the Bible, that God, it will, it will be the truth that guides our lives, our marriages, our finances, our, our decisions, but also God, we will be people of the spirit, that God, we would be people who expect the miracles and see the prophecies and experience the visions and dreams. Oh God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Now, just where you are, take a moment, ask God to be freshly filled with the Holy Spirit. Commit afresh to being a word person and a spirit person. Just pray your prayers just now. While people are praying, I'm aware maybe you're joining today and you're, you're hearing these things and it's quite out there. You feel maybe you're joining for the first time and you think, wow, this is, this is a bit full on, but you know it's true. And I want to invite you today to come to Jesus Christ. You're a sinner, you need a savior. And Jesus is the only one. He died on the cross for you, he rose again, and he invites you to come to him today. So that's you. While everyone else is praying their prayers, for you in particular, this is your moment to pray your prayer. So if that's you and you wanna commit yourself to being a follower of Jesus, then pray this prayer with me just now. Say, dear Lord God, I'm so grateful for your love for me. Jesus, I believe you died and rose again. And I believe you're alive right now. So today I commit my life to you. Here's my life. I commit my future to you. And I turn from my sins and I choose to follow you, Jesus. Jesus, be Lord of my life from now, now on and fill me with your wonderful Holy Spirit. Thanks for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And as you prayed that prayer, I know that God has heard you. And as a church, we want to do everything we can to help you grow in that decision you've made. Please let us know you've made that decision. For the rest of us, let's continue as word and spirit people. God bless.
thanks Pete for your word and thanks to the worship guys for leading us. Just want to um, bring your attention to something really important which is Easter, Easter weekend and really encourage you to be part of what we are planning to do. We've got Good Friday, we've got Easter Sunday. Let me talk about Easter Sunday first of all um, and you will be able to connect with Church Online on Easter Sunday at half past ten and we will celebrate the risen Jesus. That's a key moment in our life. But before the Easter Sunday, we have Good Friday. Good Friday is an opportunity for us as a church to slow down, to reflect. I honestly believe that the more we reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus, then the greater our celebration is of, of his resurrection on the Sunday. So that they go together. Don't miss out on the Good Friday. Good Friday, um, we will also have baptisms in the diadem. And if you are a follower of Jesus and you say that you follow him and you're not baptized, then this is your moment. You don't need to debate it. You don't need to think any more about it. Just take the step. God is asking you to do that. So Good Friday is your opportunity. You can connect through that um, with your um pastor in your community and find out the details or you can email us at contact at cityonahill.org.uk the other thing to say about good friday so a moment to reflect and the baptisms but the other thing to say is between 12 o'clock and 3 p.m in the diadem we will have what we're calling a prayer path i'm really looking forward to it prayer path you will enter the building and there will be different stations different moments where you can pause sit down read scripture look at a poem look at a picture and just personally and on your own engage with God and each station will take you further through the building and ultimately you will finish then at the cross and take time to reflect on that so that's between 12 noon and 3 p.m and I'd love you to connect with us um, for that moment as well. So, thank you so much. Um, virtual coffee is coming up. That's your opportunity just to stay online and connect with people, um, make new friends, and just be part of the community. Church Online, next Sunday, half past 10, as usual. And if you want any further details of any of these events, go to cityonahill.org dot uk coming up and you will find all the details for our easter weekend i'm just going to pray before we um, go our different ways lord god you've spoken your word has come into our lives and into our hearts and i pray that you will give grace and courage and strength that we put into practice what you have spoken to us today. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much and have a blessed rest of the day. Thank you.